I have the privilege to announce today the lecture, the special lecture by Barbara Mazzolai from uh, the Center of Micro Robotics in Pontedera of the Italian Institute of Technology. Barbara, uh, as uh, you read uh, in her uh, CV, has uh, a very interesting uh, profile because uh, she was born as a biologist. Then she moved to biophysics, and later she moved her interest in biorobotics, namely robotics that were the design of robots is inspired by biological, biological living organisms. In particular, in the recent years after she had various uh, activity. One was uh, very, a very exciting uh, robotics related to octopus uh, years ago, and uh, she developed uh, very good relations with the octopus, and uh, she was never able to eat an octopus uh, anymore after uh, they get friendships. But uh, the and uh, now she she has uh, concentrated. She focused quite a lot. On the bio, on the plants inspired robotics. Uh, robotics is one of the really hard, hardcore uh, topic of the uh, Italian Institute of Technology. And in this sense, the research line of Barbara is one of the most original ones. Uh, I, I would say that uh, we met uh, years ago and uh, we start collaborating in the sense that um, you, you may ask uh, what mathematicians have to do with the robotics and biology, but uh, there is a lot. To, of course, today Barbara will make a very general talk, so she will not uh, talk about <laughs> mathematics. But uh, uh, I have to tell you that we have uh, we started a, a collaboration which was related to the communication in plants, uh, to modeling growth, uh, a, a trying uh, by using mathematics to explain a certain behavior of the plants. Why, you know, there is a, a somehow a sort of a, a intelligence in the living organism that goes beyond the fact that you have a brain or you don't have a brain. Uh, and uh, plants behave like... Uh, Somehow, like uh, they, they do have uh, their, 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 their irrationality that uh, is, goes beyond the fact that they don't have developed the nervous system. So, Barbara, with Barbara, now we start a new adventure, which is a European project that had a workshop the, two days, the past couple of days before. And this project is called the Grow Boat. Grow Boat means growing robots. It's dedicated to climbing plants. And we are, in particular, we, in GSSI, we are collaborating with her group and the group in Tel Aviv. We are collaborating on modeling in, uh, of the plants growth. So it is really a great pleasure because, uh, in addition, you know, the community that was created by Growbot is a very lively community. Even the personal relations between the members of the community, this does not happen often in the scientific community, but I have to say that is really a very pleasant environment also to go to, from a social point of view, not only to do science, but even to, to do social life. And then, uh, so I'm very happy to show, to have here today Barbara to talk to you. And uh, so Barbara, the topic of the, conf, the lecture of Barbara will be towards a new generation of a self-growing plant inspired the robots. So Barbara, please. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Piero, for the kind introduction. I'm very very pleased to be here. We spent uh, three days, uh, fantastic days in L'Aquila, uh, discussing about I mean, this project with the colleagues and also had uh, yesterday a very nice uh, uh, tour in the, in the L'Aquila, it's a fantastic city, and uh, very good food, I have to say. <laughs> so we really enjoy uh, the, the visit and the discussion. So it's a pleasure because uh, uh, the idea is to share with you 
some of the activities, the recent activities that we are performing in the field of bioinspired soft robotics. This is my, my research area. That means that, uh, as uh, Piero said, that we take inspiration by nature, by natural organisms, to, to make innovation in different fields uh, and uh, to make a new machines, a new technology. This is the, this is the goal. And, uh, but, I mean, the, the first question is, uh, uh, what do robots envy to living beings? Uh, actually, there are many features that uh, we would like to, I mean, extract from the living organism and to implement in, uh, in the artificial uh, system, uh, like the intelligent behavior, the materials, uh, the sensing capability. But probably there is uh, one feature that uh, integrates uh, all of them, uh, the adaptation. So the living organisms are uh, designed to um, sorry, are um, designed to adapt to very unstructured environment. So they have to deal with uh, uncertain situation. They have to predict uh, these uh, unstructured uh, condition. And this is exactly what we would like to implement in the robot of tomorrow. So the adaptation to these uh, very unstructured environments. And so this is our vision. So created this robot that can really operate in this kind of environment in which uh, there are no predefined uh, tasks or action like in industrial context in which the robots really operate in a very efficient way but they are pre-programmed by the human operator, and the environment is very well defined and advanced. But when the robot has to move in this kind of uh, situation for rescue, for monitoring, or other kind of task, for them, it's very complex. And so the idea is to implement this feature from the natural organism exactly to address this kind of scenarios. And this is our approach. So our approach is a science-based approach and is very much grounded on bioinspiration, as I said. So our idea is to identify first the biological system that we want to imitate for some specific functionality, as I said, and then translate this specification by simplify, of course, in machines for some specific application. I will show you some ideas that we have in mind. But at the same time, because these robots are deeply based on bioinspiration, as I said, so they are, are designed based on the biological principle, our idea is to come back to the biology. And so sometimes we can use these robots as a platform for the scientists to validate the hypothesis on the biological system that we take as a model. So at the end, the goal is doing science and technology. So this is uh, our approach in uh, the Center for Microbiorobotics. So we start to really identify the abilities uh, in uh, natural organisms that we want to implement in our robot. Uh, here, there are just some uh, examples, like uh, growing. Uh, we will discuss about uh, growing, morphing, climbing. But there are many anchoring, energy harvesting, and so on. So we select, as I said, the model. In particular, in our center, our model are soft animals, in particular invertebrates, like uh, octopus, as Piero said, but also snails or uh, lombricus, and so on, and then plants. And uh, uh, the idea is then to use, uh, as, a, as I said, as a specification for dif different applications. These are the main applications that we are addressing. And then I will show you some examples, like uh, manipulation grasping, industrial context, uh, space or archaeology, but also soil and environmental monitor. This is uh, my initial idea, because in biophysics, uh, I study the effect of uh, pollutants on humans' health and environment and, so, and food. I would like to use uh, the technology to detect uh, also this kind of pollutant in a real environment. So, um, in particular, I would like to start uh, just to mention the, the initial activity on octopus, because uh, we can say that uh, this activity on uh, soft robotics, that is uh, the area of robotics, which include this uh, uh, bioinspired approach, really started from this uh, amazing animal. So why octopus is so amazing, especially not only from biologists, but also for roboticists? Uh, 
Uh, first of all, because it's an invertebrate, as I said, it's a mollusk, uh, but it doesn't have uh, any rigid uh, structure, any skeleton. And so it can bend, it can move uh, in any direction. It can squeeze the body and also uh, enter in very uh, narrow spaces. Uh, but at the same time, it's not just uh, soft. It can uh, uh, contract this, uh, um, regulate the stiffness, co-contracting the muscle. And so it can apply stronger force to the environment. So it's not just uh, soft and it's important for, um, for roboticists because it can grasp, it can manipulate objects, uh, it uses the sac as a sort of fingers to adhere, to, uh, to uh, manipulate and explore the environment. But what is also very important uh, is the control of the octopus, that is a distributed control. In fact, what is very interesting also from a robotics point of view is that most of the neurons are not in the brain, but are distributed in the eight arms. And probably this is due to the complexity of the body that cannot be controlled, as I said, by, this, by a single brain. So it can bend, and they show, at least virtually, infinite degree of freedom. So they can move and bend in any point of the arm. But how they can control? this complexity. So the neurons are distributed in the arm, and many movements are controlled by the peripheral nervous system. So this is also another value from an robotics point of view. But not only uh, brain, not only uh, central uh, uh, nervous system and the peripheral nervous system, uh, another secret of this uh, animal is the muscular hydrostat. So they have the, the arrangement of this muscle are named the uh, muscular hydrostat, that means that the volume remains constant during the contraction. And the animal plays with this arrangement, so they can uh, uh, elongate the arm, they can contract, they can bend, as I said, in any direction. It can also twist uh, the arms. But they can contract uh, all the muscle at the same time and apply strong force, as I said, to the environment. So the initial idea was to quantify these uh, features from uh, moving from biology to the engineering side. So how we can design a robot starting from this uh, observation. So uh, just uh, to show you the, the approach, uh, of course, uh, we perform uh, several analysis, but we start with a simple tool um, to measure, uh, for example, the elongation capability of a single arm that is amazing because uh, they can elongate more than 70% uh, with the respect to the rest the position of the arm. So it's incredible. And in order to, con to elongate the arm, they have to contract the transverse muscle. So there is a wave of contraction, and they can elongate the arm. But they can apply, as I say, the strong force to the environment, and we measure the force applied by a single uh, arm that is more than 50 newton for one single arm. So we characterize by using also not invasive uh, tools, uh, the arrangement of the muscle inside the arm, the arrangement of the nerve cord, the distribution of the neurons, as I say, the, the control capability. And then uh, we move to some uh, um, prototypes to test the different capabilities. This is a, a, a soft arm uh, actuated by cable and the transversal muscle, so in order to uh, control the bending, as I said, in other direction. But very interesting, we uh, develop uh, um, uh, actuators uh, to elongate uh, the, the arms. As I say, the, they contract the transverse muscle and we have an elongation. So the idea was to imitate this contraction by using uh, uh, shape memory alert springs. So uh, applying the current, we have the contraction like the muscle. And then uh, we have uh, the, the cooling phase, uh, and these uh, uh, springs uh, can come back to the original position. Usually, these uh, uh, actuators are very effective in terms of force that we can generate, but they need a time for the cooling phase, so to come back to the original position. But because uh, we uh, work in water, because the environment is fundamental for living organisms, but it's fundamental for the robots uh, as well. So we need to consider the environment in which uh, the living organisms move, act, 
because uh, this is the way in which the living organism reduces the complexity of the control, and so they use the environment for many movement, for many action. It's the same for the octopus. And so the robots move and act in water as well, and so we accelerate the cooling phase in this way, and this is real time. So then uh, we develop, of course, uh, we implement uh, many different uh, solutions, also in terms of uh, control, and uh, we develop uh, these oct uh, eight uh, uh, arms, uh, eight arm uh, uh, octopus robot uh, that moves, in fact, in water, as I said. So different uh, uh, arms that are used for the movement, the crawling movement that is fundamental also in the octopus because they push with the rare uh, arms in order to move on the bottom. But when we start together with the Cecilia Laschi from Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna, that was uh, the coordinator of this project, I was the uh, scientist involved in the, in the consortium, uh, the idea was uh, in which way we can use uh, these uh, robots, what are the applications that we have in mind. So of course in the proposal we have to report also the scenario, no? it's not easy sometimes because as I said, we start really from the basic science. So our idea was, uh, using this uh, octopus soft robot uh, uh, for exploration in, uh, in, uh, in water on the bottom uh, without uh, damage for the living creature. And in fact, uh, now there are new projects uh, dedicated to this uh, exploration uh, capability of this soft uh, robot. But more than this, uh, um, recently has been uh, uh, developed a soft endoscope uh, within another European project coordinated by um, uh, UK, uh, this is the coordinator, Caspar Althofer, that use the concept of uh, stiffness variation based on the contraction of the muscle of the, the octopus arm to develop a soft endoscope that can enter inside the body without any damage for the tissue, but at the same time can apply force when it's needed to operate inside the body. And uh, I can say that in the beginning, never <laughs> no, we thought about this application. So I think that this is important because sometimes when you start from basic science, you don't really know about the future application. And so we can really generate a new enabling technologies. This was the case. And now uh, with my group, we continue the investigation on the octopus, especially on the octopus suckers, because the very amazing uh, structure. They explore, as I said, the environment using the sucker because the sucker uh, embeds uh, um, chemo receptor, tactile receptor, so they can really understand the environment uh, by using the sucker. And then they can manipulate, grasp objects. So from a robotics point of view, it's an amazing uh, uh, potential uh, robotic uh, um, technology. And so we start again from biology. This was our approach. At that time, we needed the 3D reconstruction of the sucker. And our approach was starting from the, the available uh, literature on the octopus sucker. So this is uh, what is uh, named acetabulum, that is a sort of mm, dome uh, of, the, of this structure. And this is the infundibulum, that is the part that enters in contact with the substrate. So we perform several analyses of this uh, sucker, but what happens, uh, we discover, in fact, uh, a new uh, anatomical uh, structure, never described in literature, that is this protuberance. So we, we use uh, different techniques, so histology, MRI, uh, ultrasound, uh, and so on. And in all the uh, analyses, uh, we obtain the, the same evidence, uh, a protuberance. A protuberance that then we describe with uh, a uh, potential model, uh, no, it seems uh, that is very uh, important uh, for maintaining the adhesion because what happens is the contraction of the radial muscle, the water is uh, 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 pulled off from the, 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 from the sucker and then uh, we the, the sucker generates uh, a negative pressure inside by contracting the transverse muscle, also the acetabulum. And then uh, the peripheral uh, the peripheral muscle uh, close the operculum in this way and maintain this negative pressure inside the, the, inside the sac. So our idea, but of course we have to, to prove with some uh, experimental trials that are not very uh, easy, 
is that in this way uh, the, the sucker can stop to contract the, the muscle in order to reduce the energy consumption because the uh, octopus can stay attached uh, to the wall or to the, to the rocks uh, for hours and that, so it's not possible to think that it's an active contraction for all the time. And uh, very interesting, uh, here in this area we also find uh, hertz, hierarchic hertz, a three level of uh, uh, hierarchy, and uh, uh, mucus, of course, but we don't know, actually, there are no any evidence in literature about the, ro the role of hertz uh, uh, for, for the octopus. So we suppose that they have a role in uh, sensing, but probably also in the adhesion. And like in another system, in other fish, that they have suckers to adhere to rocks. But this is really ongoing. We don't know the meaning of these hierarchical hairs. So starting from the 3D reconstruction of all this information from the biological side, we develop a CAD model, and then we use it for the molding. And we use, in order to create the artificial sucker, material with properties, mechanical properties, very close to the natural one. So we investigate also the mechanical properties of the sucker. So what is very important, as I mentioned before, is that the sucker works very well in water. Again, this is salt water. And what we also demonstrate is that if passively we increase the number of the growth on the infundibulum, like the natural system, we increase uh, just uh, with the body, with the morphology, the material, more than 30% the adhesion properties. So what is important is uh, really um, in robotics, and this is a new trend in robotics, uh, think about the body, as I said, the morphology, the material, not only the control, and the very important, the interaction with the environment. The environment plays an important role in the, I mean, in reducing, as I said, the complexity of living organism. What we can do, this is, a, we are just at the end of this industrial project that was funded by, by Annie, um, that was exactly to retrieve objects from wells that accidentally fall down. Don't, don't ask why, but they have this problem, so they have to stop the production to retrieve this object in different kind of uh, wells. And so the specification was uh, quite, uh, I mean, tough because uh, the maximum diameter is uh, seven centimeter, and we use uh, quite, uh, for us, a uh, high pressure and oil and dirty condition. And so by implementing this uh, octopus arm uh, together with the suckers, we uh, were able to retrieve a different kind of object. So we, um, instead to have a rigid tool to collect just uh, few kind of, uh, of object. The idea was to have a robot that can adapt the morphology to the external environment, including different objects. This was the, the, the idea that we uh, proposed to this company. So this is the new, it's uh, just a start about the, the muscular hydrostat. Uh, is a new fat open project that is uh, on uh, elephant trunk because the muscular hydrostat uh, are just in octopus, elephant trunk, and our tongue. And so, again, we want to study the, the capability of the elephant trunk to um, adapt to different environments, but also to uh, manage a high and low payload. This is a very peculiar of the elephant trunk. And so we will study, again, the anatomy, uh, together with biologists, uh, of this uh, elephant trunk, and then we try to translate. We are in charge for the development actuator. And this is a very, I mean, complex task because we have to develop actuators that are soft, but at the same time can tune the stiffness, as I said before, in order to apply not only, I mean, delicate manipulation, but strong forces. So, animals. Fundamental, I like animals, um, marine biology is in my background, so octopus was for this, of course. But more recently, um, I uh, propose for the first time plants as new modern robotics. The idea was exactly to develop uh, an autonomous uh, robot for soil exploration. And uh, we develop, uh, I didn't show, but we develop uh, uh, service robots for uh, air detection for uh, water uh, detection, different kind of uh, autonomous robot for environmental application. But 
Detecting uh, soil and uh, to perform uh, uh, analysis in soil is uh, very complex because uh, we can consider soil as an extreme environment. Uh, pressure and friction very high in few centimeters. And so we say that how we can uh, face uh, uh, this, uh, this complex environment. Uh, look at the, uh, at the biology. What is evident is that the most adaptable and adapted uh, any, uh, living organism is not an animal, but it's the plant. They move, in fact, in soil using their roots, and they explore in a very efficient way the, uh, the environment, in a very capillary way. So we move to plants exactly to develop this kind of robots. But when I start to propose uh, eight, uh, more or less, uh, years ago for the first time to the roboticists, to the robotic community, this idea, People <laughs> look at me and I was uh, mad. And I said, why? You want to propose uh, plants as a modern robotics. Uh, plants uh, don't move, they don't perceive the environment. Uh, uh, they don't have a control. And you know that uh, robots have to move, uh, interact with the environment, perceive the environment, have a certain degree of intelligence. But in fact, plants move. They move a lot. They move uh, continuously. And, uh, of course, they move in a different way. They don't have a muscle. So they uh, move uh, uh, usually by growing. So adding new cells, new, new materials, in the apical region, so in the part that are far from the trunk, in the shoot, in the, in the root. And at the apical level, they have the perception capability. So they can explore the environment, they can perceive you know, the, the different stimuli in the environment. They communicate. They communicate using, especially in the roots, especially in soil, they create a network. And they crea create a symbiosis with the ife or fungi, so the mycelium, and, so, and they exchange information using this uh, network. There are scientists that are investigating this, uh, this uh, network that are named Wood Wild Web. And there are a lot of new knowledge about the importance of this communication also for surviving to help young uh, trees uh, during the different period of season. So they exchange information when they are attacked by enemies. So it's a very complex behavior. And our idea, and we started with the Piero, is actually from the communication in plants, uh, actually we start with the internal communication. Our idea is to understand if the epics in a root apparatus uh, communicate, exchange information in order to be more efficient in the soil exploration. This is the idea. And so we have to understand, using also math approach, the energy needed for that. And the cost-benefit analysis is another aspect that could be very relevant for this kind of uh, study. So, in particular, as I said, we focus on roots. So, in which way they move in soil? As I said, they move by growing. This is uh, the, the way in which they can address the high pressure in soil. So, they add a new cell here at this level, and then absorb the water from the environment, and they push in, the, in, in soil. So, the only part that is moving is the tip, and the rest of the body doesn't move. And at the tip level, they have... Uh, sensing properties, so they can perceive the gravity, they can perceive the water, chemicals, they can avoid the obstacle or other dangerous pollutants. And this is exactly the behavior that is called tropism in biology, so they move following or escaping from environmental stimuli, and we want to implement it. We have actually implemented this behavior in our robot. And then exactly the network that I mentioned before, no? in which way they communicate and which kind of information they exchange in order to extract information for new algorithm and control strategy of this uh, swarm intelligent behavior, if you want. So I show you just uh, the, the results of this, uh, uh, of this analysis. It was a very long uh, process, especially understand that the growing was the secret. And so we implemented the robot, this movie by growing concept, and, uh, integrating the tip, uh, a 3D miniaturizer, uh, 3D printer machine, miniaturizer 3D printer machine. So we use uh, the um, <laughs> thermoplastic filament. This is commercially available, it's a PLA. And uh, inside the tip, uh, we have uh, a motor, you can see also here, uh, a motor that uh, pulls the filament from a spool and then gears 
that allow the perfect deposition to a new filament in contact with the tip. So also in the robot, the only part that is pushing is the tip. And uh, there is a resistor inside the tip, so the material is melted for a few seconds at a 200 degree, so it becomes sticky and can adhere to the previous layer. So layer by layer, the robot can create its own body. The direction growing is given by the sensor integrating the tip and the tropism associated to this sensor. So we have the tactile sensor and tigmotropism that is negative, so uh, the, the roots tend to touch and then if the impedance of soil increases too much, try to find another, another path, another direction. Then the temperature, uh, humidity sensor, chemical sensor for nitrogen, phosphate, pH, and then uh, gravity, of course, for the gravitropism. So the roots uh, tend to move following the vector uh, of the gravity. And uh, so we, um, just to show you uh, more in detail the, uh, the deposition mechanism, uh, as I said, there is a, a resistor inside, uh, and so the temperature increases, you can see here, and the material uh, really becomes sticky and uh, can uh, adhere to the previous layer. And uh, here is the way in which uh, we implement uh, the, the, the control. So uh, Emanuela, uh, that is uh, here, is the, uh, the, the person that is in charge uh, for, for the control and uh, also the testing of the robot. So we have uh, two different strategies. In, uh, this is the previous uh, uh, method in which uh, we, in order to bend, because this is another important aspect of this robot, the robot uh, has to bend to follow or escape from the, the environmental stimuli. And this was uh, really difficult. Uh, can I say that we spent more than one year to understand how to bend our robot before using thermoplastic material. And so we have... Uh, or an half deposition, so we deposit more material on one side with respect to the other side, or we control, and the result is the same, we control the velocity of the deposition. In both the cases, we have more material. In the case of the root, the natural root, they deposit more cell, and then they elongate in order to have the band. Um, we also test, of course, the performance of our robot in terms of pressure, during the movement, and now we can reach 10 kilo in air. And then we test also in different kinds of soil, but in particular in granular medium, in which the temperature and humidity are controlled, because one of the problems in soil is that the soil are completely different to uh, each other, and also they change the properties depending by the humidity content and also the, the temperature. And so we uh, define our specification with this kind of soil. And then uh, this is the new, uh, the new version of the robot in which we try to implement also the passive behavior of the root, the natural root, because before they touch, but they also passively adapt to the environment. And then they activate you know, a chemical reaction in order to distribute the, the cell in a differential way. And so we implemented this passive morphological adaptation of the robot to the external environment. Again, the control and the energy, as I said, is one of the key points. Depending by the application, this kind of behavior could be very useful. But there are other kind of movement in plants, just to show you some of them. Stiffened variation is not just an animal. We see how octopus can control and regulate the, the stiffness. Water can produce this natural hardness by playing with the water inside the tissue, their tissue. And so what is called a turgor pressure. So our idea was exactly to implement a new actuator based on osmosis, so on the movement of water from one side with a minor ionic concentration to one side with a major ionic concentration. So water moves in this direction. We put a, a osmotic membrane and a, a different membrane to generate, of course, a movement. And we start with a simple mathematical model. My colleague, Eduardo Sinibaldi, developed this model in order to extract the specification of our uh, actuator. In particular, the time scale, that is very important. In this case, it's one minute, and it, because it's a poor forward osmosis, like in plant. 10 millimeter length scale, because osmosis 
works uh, very well at a micro scale, so dimension is fundamental. And, al oh, sorry. and also uh, the um, maximum force that we can generate that was fixed on 20 Newton. And this is the actuator. So um, we take inspiration from different plants and mechanisms based on osmosis in plants. So as I said, we have two chambers, one for the um, osmolite, in this case is uh, sodium chloride, the other one is for the solvent of water. Then we use osmotic membrane and a bulging membrane to show, of course, the, the motion, the, the movement. It's a very simple, we just uh, add the water and uh, in one minute, maximum two, we obtain the actuation, so as you can see here. And we obtain, in fact, uh, uh, 20 Newton as a, as a force. Um, so uh, these are other ways in which we can obtain a movement from, uh, from the plant, and this is just to show you, uh, there are many other movements, but just uh, to, to show you the um, the robot in which we have a trunk just to send the message that is inspired by plants. There is no an important role except that the material and the electronics is inside the, the, the trunk. And then this kind of material that are very important because uh, many movements in plants are completely passive and uh, given by the material that interact with the humidity change in variation air. So this is another idea that we are implementing in robotics. And then roots uh, with several uh, sensors, as I said, and tropism, uh, so negative and positive tropism that can uh, move uh, then in soil uh, by interacting with the environment, but also uh, very important by, by growing. Uh, that is the, the message that we are implementing, the new paradigm that we are implementing in robotics. And this is the new, uh, the future, uh, together with uh, Yasmin Bero, that is uh, here, together with uh, Piero Marcati, these are the consortium. We have uh, no, uh, the Helmut uh, Centrum, uh, Tel Aviv, uh, GSSI, Scuola Sant'Anna, University of Fribourg, uh, Linear Engineering, that are company, CNRS, and the BIO, that is another company. What is the idea in this project? Uh, again, uh, take inspiration by nature. The model in this case are climbing plants. Uh, that are really amazing because uh, they don't develop uh, usually a uh, strong trunk or sophisticated root apparatus, but they use uh, most of the energy that they have uh, to go faster than the other plants uh, towards light. But because they don't have uh, this very sophisticated trunk, in order to avoid to collapse, they have to anchor, you know, they have to adhere to other uh, plants or to other uh, uh, structures, so they have a tendril, they have a spines, so they have adhesive pads, and uh, they move by growing again. So this is exactly what we want to implement in the robots, uh, because we would like to have robots that are able to move in this very unstructured environment for environmental monitoring, agriculture, and so on. So. This is uh, uh, what we start, uh, starting from the beginning of this, uh, of this year. So moving by growing, anchoring themselves, uh, negotiating voids. No? So this is very important. Again, uh, growing can help on that. And then, of course, uh, we have a robot without a predefined path. So we don't know in advance the body of our robot, like in plants. So they continuously change their morphology. They show high plasticity because depending by the interaction with the external environment. And this is our idea, so heavy in situ fabrication of responsive architecture. And starting from that, this is one of the first results from my group. We developed the first tendril like a soft robot that is based again on osmosis. But in this case, the robot is reversible. So we implement soft chambers, we put uh, soft electrodes in carbon material, uh, carbo carbon fiber inside the, the two cells, and so we can play, apply uh, low voltage with the, the distribution of the ions in the two, in two cells, and a consequent movement of water, as I said before. So the turgor is generated by the content water inside the, the, the arm. And so, the, of course, uh, these are some uh, numbers, so we can play with this kind of uh, morphology, uh, materials, as I say, the water that is uh, cheap, but is uh, very convenient, uh, like uh, for, for plants. Uh, and so we develop uh, these uh, 
kind of a very adaptable uh, tendril-like uh, robot, uh, especially for anchoring, as you can see here, because there are many applications in which uh, anchoring uh, is fundamental. And this is the, the last uh, uh, activity that I would like to mention. This is very new, actually. Uh, we are performing this experiment also within Growbot, uh, together also with the Bio, that is a company, a Spanish company. Um, we want to generate uh, uh, energy from plants. Uh, so what we discover is actually that uh, uh, by um, playing with the anatomy of the, 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 of the leaves, we can convert uh, mechanical into electrical energy. This is the, the way in which we can convert uh, generated this energy. So using uh, soft material like a silicon that are in contact with the leaves, we generate uh, uh, I am charge, you know, that uh, negative charge compensated by uh, opposite charge, and we can use uh, this uh, charge inside the, 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 the leaves and the steel to uh, supply uh, artificial uh, system. This is the way in which we select the material because what is important in the triboelectric effect, this is the name of this uh, phenomenon, is the uh, frequency, the impact force that we apply to the, to the leaves in this case, and the, also the material in contact. If I touch the leaves with my hand, the, the energy that I can produce is very low, and also the contact area. And what we discover uh, very recently is that with just one leaf, we can power the 100 LED and uh, we can uh, produce uh, 150 volts. Of course, what is uh, the, probably you know very well the problem, this kind of triboelectric effect, because uh, we don't generate continuous energy, but uh, it's a, a, a pulsate energy. And so um, our idea is then to use uh, real plants to generate energy, and also to have a more sustainable solution and so we want to uh, uh, integrate these uh, soft, uh, and, um, soft uh, leaves, artificial leaves, uh, with the natural leaves, uh, and the use of the wind, uh, actually, to generate the... So together with also another group, the, the University of Freiburg, we are testing all the, the characteristics that we need to consider, like the, the speed of wind, you know, the humidity content, and so on. But this is something that we would like to really implement in the future. Application. This is a new project that we have in the Tuscany region for agriculture. So we have to use the next year our plantoid for detecting uh, 20, 15 uh, centimeter of soil, detecting humidity and temperature in particular. And uh, uh, space, uh, we start actually with the space application uh, with uh, the European Space Agency because a root, but also climbing plant, uh, as I said, are very useful for, for anchoring not only for exploration. Uh, Ancore is a, a key issue, an open issue in space application. And then uh, um, our idea is also uh, to use, uh, in future scenario, this is especially for robot application, this robot that can adapt in a very unstructured environment under debris for archaeology, for exploration of this kind of, also an industrial context, of course. This is the idea. But also in the future, we would like to develop our infrastructure, not within the grow bot, but as a concept, we could grow our infrastructure in the society in order to be more sustainable you know, and have a less impact in our, in our cities. So what we can learn from plants, that the structure really evolve in accordance with the environment. So environment, as I said, is fundamental for living organisms in the future, more and more for the robots as well. We don't need uh, central processes for control, at least not only, because it really depends by the complexity of the body, and the plants are so complex, uh, and probably just one brain is not enough to control all this movement, or at least to perceive environment. And GROW is an efficient strategy of movement that we want to implement in this kind of robot. Of course, this is a, a, an important receipt, so we need to involve different people with different disciplines, different background in the group. This is one of the most difficult parts. In our consumption, I'm very happy because all the groups are different and really collaborate with each other you know, to improve not only, as I say, the innovation, but also the basic science. This is also fundamental for me. 
And I would like to end with this dream. This is just a dream for the moment. But uh, I really would like in the future to develop a robot that can grow, evolve, uh, interact with the uh, humans, with the living system in a very safe way, change the shape, also use the environment for energy harvesting, and at a certain point they can really be integrated in the environment, so they can dis disappear and be biodegradable in order to reduce the impact in the environment. Think about the plantoid and the future. We could consider this kind of robot that detect different parameters, but at a certain point they are degraded by bacteria, by different kind of system. This is dream, but I hope to, at a certain point, obtain it no? <laughs> and reach my, my wish. Together with my colleagues, uh, Emanuela is here, these are some uh, of the people that work to, together with me on different uh, uh, topics. Uh, Fabio Tedone, that uh, is uh, here, is a joint PhD together with uh, uh, GSSI, so we have a lot of uh, colleagues, uh, and uh, this is uh, really an important result of my, on my, my work. And then, of course, all of you for your kind of attention. Thank you so much. <laughs> So, who is the first one? Come on. I know that Barbara is tremendously clear, but you should, uh, I'm sure some of you are curious. Yes, you know. Okay, oh, finally. The youngest one. <laughs> My friend. Uh, Just to break the ice. Now, uh, I would ask, uh, what do you think about the possibility to combine synthetic biology with your biorobots? So when I only say synthetic biology, I mean the, not only the molecules, but even the cells build up um, by synthetic uh, means. So I think that you can uh, give a brain to your robot in this way. Yeah. Do you think so? Yeah, I think so. I have a, two main limitations in this, uh, in this uh, moment. Uh, I very often think about the solution, also because plants work much better than, than my robot. But I have to, uh, the, uh, at least now, two different kinds of problems. First of all, integrating living tissue, living uh, cell, living organism in a um, artifact uh, and maintain uh, in some way the, the, the properties or the, the living uh, part uh, in this kind of environment, so in the real soil, uh, interacting uh, with the artificial part. So now we are seeing uh, hybrid system in humans after many, many years uh, of investigation, the signal that they have to detect from the, the human arm in order to then control the hand. So now we don't have a lot of information from a biological point of view about the signal that I have to control with the robot because with the robot I can interact. I can in some way say to the robot, uh, uh, goes in this direction, detect this pollutant or you know, avoid the obstacle and so on. My question is, uh, in which way I can interact with the plant and use the plant as a real biosensor or you know, bio-organism um, that can improve the performance of the artificial part. So uh, your point is in my, my mind. Uh, for the moment, uh, I have some limitation in terms of knowledge, in terms of technology uh, to implement a real working bio hybrid system. That could be great. I mean if we can really implement this kind of solution 
could be great because we can be more effective. Uh, really, we can detect uh, many different stimuli, and so it could be very, very great. In this moment, I have some uh, limitation in terms of knowledge, in terms of technology to implement this idea. But we will consider that. Yeah, really interesting. Um, my question is just a curiosity. Uh, so what's the status of this uh, kind of research all over the world, so not just in Europe? And if there, are, there is uh, some robot which is already working on the field, on some even easy application? Yeah. Um, this is, I mean, I started this research line uh, eight, uh, ten years ago was not possible to talk about plants uh, in robotics. Now, there are uh, groups uh, in Stanford, in MIT, that recently started, and Clemson in uh, USA, not in Europe, USA. They start to uh, especially take inspiration by climbing plants, even if uh, our approach is much more uh, deeper in uh, science, as I say. They are more dedicated to the application but less on the, the principle, the, the real principle, are not really inside the robot. But they start to consider the growth. Uh, they don't have a growth in terms of adding new material, but they grow more in uh, aversion. So they have this pipe, uh, soft pipe, and they use a pneumatic solution to uh, move an air and uh, detect some uh, unstructured situation. The, the goal is the same as our goal. In Europe, there are no group, not now, not for the moment, uh, just in USA, and there are no uh, pr products. All of them are prototypes, and for the moment, are just really in the in the lab. We have some, uh, uh, like the regional task and regional. We we have some project more oriented to the application, but I have to say that it's very difficult to move in the real environment because. Uh, we, many of the feature plans are still missing. We know what we need. We don't know how to implement it from a technological point of view. So we need a lot of uh, uh, development, uh, collaboration with uh, experts. Uh, we need the materials, because the material that we use now are not, uh, are not the best. So we are developing our own materials to, to implement also sensing properties along the body, not only in the teeth. Then the roots change the morphology because when they uh, touch the soil and the, the impedance is very high, they change the morphology. So they increase the diameter, they produce a lateral hair, so they anchor and then they push, like the lumbricus. Because the physics is the same, no? And so if you compare system without legs, the movement of the strategy they implement are very similar. In the lumbricus, you have a, uh, liquid inside, and they play with the liquid in order to apply force, but they anchor fast. The roots uh, are able to do the same, but we are not able to, <laughs> now we are working on that, to implement all these features in the same uh, prototype. So there are a lot of uh, work to do. Is there any um, algorithmic issue that is worth to investigate in this contest? Uh, issue in, uh, in algorithmic. Oh. Is. Ah, algorithmic. Uh, yes, we have. Uh, I mean, the, the person uh, in charge are exactly here. We have uh, our idea. We started with Emanuela, with uh, her PhD thesis. Uh, the idea was exactly to implement these. Uh, not only control based on the tropism that is already implemented in the, in the robot, but also these uh, emergent behavior. Because uh, uh, they, as I said, you know, they perceive a different stimuli, but they in some way have to um, avoid uh, uh, to use the roots you know, when it is not needed. You know? For example, if uh, they have a different uh, priority for water, chemical, and so on, so we implemented this kind of uh, behavior in the robot uh, given based on this priority. So if they don't have a water, water becomes a uh, high you know, priority. And so also our roots start to look for water. But the point is uh, when they reach water, 
this priority decrease in terms of importance and they have uh, other, other, um, other stimuli to look for. But it's not enough in the sense that the question, and it was exactly the initial question also with Piero, how many of these routes look for water? Because this means uh, what is the level of deficiency of these million of apexes that move in soil in terms of energy, in terms of time that they need, and these are still uh, ongoing because uh, it's not completely clear, no, also from a biological point of view. So math, uh, I believe, that can really, really help on that. You know, the engineering approach, the physical approach, you know, study the interaction with uh, the physics of the soil, how the soil affects the, the solution the root in this case, but not only root, is fundamental. If uh, we want to in improve the knowledge of the, the basic system and then of the robots, Para questions. Preguntas? De question? <laughs> it seems that even changing language. No. Not good for the questions. Don't exist. OK. So just to let me ask you a fiction science question. Yeah. Because uh, actually, I have to tell you that what I was fascinated. Uh,